Hello, everyone. You're listening to Northern Flights, a Park Pro podcast keeping you up to date with the people, tournaments, and culture of disc golf in Canada and beyond. Consider becoming a patron today at patreon.com slash parkpro. Find us on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode is brought to you by Disc Golf Park. And now your hosts, Andre, Jesse, and Matt. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Northern Flights, episode 40. Uh, thanks to Disc Golf Park, as always, for sponsoring this episode and all of our episodes. Uh, it means a lot to have your support. If you're uh, a patron, we also thank you for that. And if you want to become a patron, <laughs> patreon.com slash parkpro. Get yourself an air horn. Uh, we had a great episode today. We got uh, some Canadian disc golf news to talk about, some disc golf pro tour talk, and we're going to have a little discussion around uh, ball golf courses. Of course, the Open at Austin being played this weekend at a uh, ball golf course, and a lot of changes happened there. Drive. Nice. <laughs> I got one for everything. There we go. <laughs> or at least those three. Yeah. Matt's just not going to talk the whole podcast and just do only soundboard stuff. Uh, awesome. If you, uh, if you like this episode and you're watching on YouTube, there's a button for, uh, for that. And uh, if you want to hear more, there's a button for that too. Uh, as they say in the biz, don't forget to like and subscribe. And more importantly, comment, because uh, we'd love hearing back from you guys, uh, letting, giving us feedback on our episodes and um, joining the discussion as well. So if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, send us a review. Uh, it means a lot to us to, to know how we're doing. So, L- Listen, Apple and Spotify are both having problems right now, technical problems. This might be a surprise to you guys, but uh, I, I understand they're having problems with their review functionality. So if you could... And mostly just like the four and five star reviews. So if you could just try it out, they've asked us if we could help, um, like, uh, help troubleshoot their software for them. So just pop on, get whatever the highest level review is. Just, just push that and see, see if it works. Um, if it doesn't work, like push it again and ask your friends to push it as well. And, um, if it does work, just great. Just let us know, Hey, the five star review functionality worked. Okay. And we'll, we'll pass that on to Spotify and Apple. If you want, you can revert your review, but you may as well just leave it. So it's a lot of work. Yeah, totally. Uh, we also have a Discord channel, so there's a lot of chatter going on there. Uh, pretty much one of the best places to talk about disc golf in Canada, for sure. Um, love talking about uh, course design and tournaments, running tournaments and stuff like that. So join that and uh, join the conversation. Uh, some sad news in, out of Canada here. Uh, Noah Higgins, one of the Canada's up and coming M- um, MPO players. Uh, he unfortunately suffered a seizure on his way to go snowboarding for the day the other day. So I'm um, really sad to hear that. And he unfortunately suffered a few more on his way to the hospital. Um, so our thoughts are with him and his mother, Rebecca, as they are going through all this and, and curious to see how this affects his, uh, tournaments going forward. So. Yeah, and uh, if you have the opportunity, head over to his socials. I know at least on Facebook, he, there's a GoFundMe up to help look after him. Um, obviously, we have a good medical um, situation here in Canada, so he doesn't have big medical bills for this, but he did crash his vehicle during the seizure, as far as I know. So he got a big bill to repair that, and he isn't allowed to drive until he's six months clear of seizures, which means getting to work and making that money and living a normal life, even getting to tournaments is going to be very challenging for him. So that money goes a long way to a great kid that deserves the support. Uh, yeah, not a lot of other news going on in Canadian disc golf. Uh, there are tournaments always opening up for registration. I know Big Bear opened up last night and the three of us managed to sneak in there and I'm excited to be attending that one this year. Uh, we, of course, we recorded it last year. Um, that's ran by a uh, sponsor of the podcast, Maddie from Disc Golf Park. So always a good tournament. Go check out our coverage of last year's event on our YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, it's nice to be able to play some terms every once in a while. So I'm excited to be playing in this one this year. We are disc golfers at the end of the day. And in the middle of the day. And sometimes at the beginning of the day. 
only get it at the end of the day. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's not there's not much else going on in uh, as far as Canadian disc golf uh, goes. Uh, unfortunately, we can kind of transition into the Pro Tour here uh, at Waco. The Canadians didn't fare too too well. Unfortunately, Thomas Gilbert, Max, and Chantel both kind of dropped uh, dropped off after their first rounds there. So um, hopefully they can rebound. I know. Uh, uh, of course, we as we are recording this podcast on Friday, we're having a little coffee episode. Um, Chantel was doing all right at uh, at the Open at Austin. It looks like she started off really strong, and she's unfortunately caught a few bogeys in in a row on the back nine. But uh, hopefully, she can rebound it and put a good showing in. So, I didn't keep up with her tournament at Waco. I don't know if either of you guys did. I know it was awesome to see her on the feature card. Yeah, um, Prodigy doing her some justice, getting her name and face out there. But I didn't see much of the golf, and now I'm feeling guilty, and I have to go look. Yeah, I, and I also, I, it's a, probably a good time to bring up that Chantel, they just came out with her uh, signature series disc, so um, you should go and check that out. They, their signature disc from Prodigy are looking pretty cool this year, and uh, if you want to show some support for Chantel, go check that out. I believe it's on uh, Prodigy's website is uh, one of the best places to get that, so um, I'm sure that they'll be re- uh, released to retailers as well. Last year, we gave away one of her um, commemorative uh, American Flying Disc Open discs to one of our lucky, either a listener or possibly a patron. I don't remember who ended up receiving it, but um, we give away discs sometimes. And uh, we give uh, anybody on the Patreon page is automatically entered to win all these discs. So who knows? Maybe maybe we'll end up with one of these Chantel Badinsky discs someday. Maybe we'll give it away. Maybe you could win it yourself. But don't count on it, so buy your own. I was going to say, we do have a disc here from the, uh, we were just talking about the Big Bear. Why don't we give this one away today? It's uh, 23rd Big Bear, um, one of the discs from last year. We meant to give it away uh, last. uh, And even look, it's a paradigm, isn't it? Yeah, paradigm. Yeah, people don't know these ones that well yet. 12 speed, not white, the destroyer type, but... uh, or our elevation and arms we have in Canada, this is very capable of being of your workhorse driver. And the plastic feels nice and grippy, and there's like a cool bursty swirl behind the stamp. And I always get the focus wrong on these. Those yeah, this one's hard to focus. Paradigms are like one of my favorite new discs that's come out in the last couple of years. You're, I think you're bang on, like Innova's has released at least a couple of discs where they're like, yeah, it's between a destroyer and a shrike for people who throw in of a, as a reference, a really, really beefy, like pro level driver and something that's pretty flippy for us less than pro level drivers. But like for me, right in between those two is exactly the sweet spot. And those paradigms are exactly in that sweet spot. So if you're like 350 to 400 max drive, Shrike is a little bit flippy for you. Destroyer is too stable. Those paradigms are nice. They go far. Yeah. Only through the ones that, like, right when they released. And you're right, just like a little baby hyzer sits up and just kind of rides straight. Little finish at the end. All right, and to win this uh, paradigm, um, head over to the uh, head over to our social media, our Instagram channel, and uh, drop a comment and let us know who your favorite player to watch was at the uh, from last year's coverage. Um, just let us know in the comments and uh, take a friend and you'll be eligible to win this. And we'll let you know on our next episode who that winner is. So a uh, huge shout out for to Maddie for providing this disc. Uh, we we're going to give it away last year and just never got around to it. So, I mean, now is probably the best time to uh, bring up Disc Golf Park. And of course, Disc Golf Park is a unique disc golf course concept developed in Finland in 2005. It is based on the idea of building sports facilities in an environmentally friendly way. Disc Golf Park provides great experiences for all players of all skill levels, from beginners to professionals. Our main ideology is to introduce disc golf to new audiences. There are several options to suit any kind of course, and all official disc golf parks include professional and safe course design, disc golf park pro targets, tee pads and tee signs, and an info board to welcome players to your course. Disc Golf Park World Concept consists of multiple courses designed for different types of players. Multi-golf is a new, fun activity for the whole family, and in multi-golf, three forms of golf are played. Golf, disc golf, and park-style pitch and putt. 
School Disc Golf Park offers students a new and exciting form of exercise for the physical education classes. A course suitable for schools can be designed even in a small area, for instance, a schoolyard. Furthermore, the costs of School Disc Golf Park are lower than those of regular disc golf parks. We also offer private and group lessons or clinics. For more information, check out the website at discgolfpark.com and request a quote today. And I will say, if you haven't played the Canmore course, go check it out. I know that registration is pretty much full. There's a bunch of wait lists. I think there's a few divisions that might have some openings still. Um, if you can't get into that, it's still worth checking out the uh, Canmore Disc Golf, uh, the Nordic, Nordic Center there. Yeah, definitely go check out that Canmore Nordic Center course. It's a blast to play, um, but it's also got a lot of disc golf history there course has been through i think the third redesign now it used to have tones those old tee pads that were just bumpy rocks you tried not to fall off of all the time and the old cbg baskets that would shoot your disc an extra 40 feet if you put high uh, and if not for a great disc golf course itself we we looked at it during our falcons or mentioned it during the falcons flight coverage because aspen meadows was tied for best in alberta and it is with nordic center course if you don't like the best course in Alberta, you'll have a blast just checking out the views and going for a hike because it is not the most cardio intensive, but one of them. And the, the views of the three sisters from up on top are just like spectacular. It's definitely one of the Canadian bucket list courses. Yeah, let's talk about the Disc Golf Pro Tour a little bit. Uh, and we can kind of, you know, cycle through this a little bit. But do uh, you guys have any thoughts on Waco last week? I feel sad for Humphreys. That's what I feel the most. Um, yeah. I watched the majority of the coverage. Um, a bit sad to see the addition of another ball golf Heiser course in Lake Waco. Um, that said, it's not as bad as a lot of a lot of other because they have enough water and trees on the course, but it's not my style of golf. Definitely seems like um Loss in quality for easier time getting video and spectators on. Yeah, it kind of seems like, uh, you know, with with the Disc Golf Network, you know, upping their subscriptions and trying to make things more professional, it seems like they're catering that course towards, you know, coverage. And obviously putting putting that course as the uh, the final day instead of, the traditional Waco course, um, I you know personally I think it's a mistake because I think you know, that whole eighteen at, at uh, the Beast one of the better whole eighteens on tour. So um, it's really unfortunate that they uh, they they moved that over. So yeah, uh, that's was my big thing. It's one of the most fun finishing holes. It's a finishing hole that can affect the outcome of the tournament, and it's one of the best finishing holes for viewership both in person and on camera so yeah risk reward that away. in the drive risk reward in the putt like every shot is a risk reward shot that's a good finishing yeah. hole to me like a couple of the most memorable moments of the last five years on the tour i've been on that hole i don't think anyone's forgotten simon throwing p2 over the lake right what's a p2 is that like a pixel or that's not funny. <laughs> uh, again, it's like uh, not the biggest tournament in the world. Early season stuff is usually forgotten halfway through the season already, and it's been years, and I will never forget Simon throwing P2 over the lake. That was super cool. Round. Been robbed of that. I I think it's pretty clear that they're trying to move to as many ball golf courses as possible for spectator infrastructure. They, I think, are planning for a future where 5,000 people can go to watch a disc golf tournament. Maybe 10,000 people. And maybe not 10,000, that's a lot of people. But 5,000 people, I think, is probably what they're kind of hoping for. And you're not going to fit 5,000 people on almost any hole at Waco. And I, I don't know if that's the way to go or not. I'm trying to think about this not as somebody that has played disc golf and watched disc golf for many years, but through the eyes of somebody that is new to the sport or doesn't play and has no interest in playing and is just strictly a spectator. And I don't know that in-person viewership is more important right now than having the best quality of disc golf. 
but again, like I've, pl I've played, I know the joys of throwing up narrow fairways in the forest. That's like one of the most satisfying and enjoyable parts of the game. And it's also one of the most fun things to watch too, is like the pros who do that so much better than me throwing shots that I could never throw through gaps in a forest that I could never hit. It's awesome. And I think that's how you're going to get more people watching is like, is, is, is bringing that experience to people. But I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's the atmosphere of the tournament that people go and there's a vendor village and there's food trucks and then they can wander over to a, a ball golf fairway and see people chucking a disc 550 feet in an open field. Like, yeah, I, I understand why they're doing it from a business standpoint. I just think that it's it's almost a different game at that point where it becomes truly about who can hit the longest putts and who can hit the circle from the furthest away on a hyzer without obstacle. And don't get me wrong, there are obstacles on those courses and things you have to navigate. The 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 cerebral part of the game is minimized a lot. and the 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 way that you can mitigate your mistakes on an open air golf course you can do a lot with disc and angle selection you're never not never but almost never truly forced to throw one shot you always have a second option and i don't think it produces the greatest display of skill that the players have in the sport i also think it's a different game to play like functionally different if you took the basketball hoop and made it lower or made the hoop bigger, you'd be playing a different game, you know, a caricature of the original. And I think that's where we're moving to. People that throw 600 feet might like it and stuff like that because it's easy for them to win. But I think the game itself has lost complexity and that is a downgrade. I think a disc golf needs trees. Like trees are the sport to me and maybe we're spoiled in Canada because we have a lot of trees and so a lot of our courses have trees, but like trees are the fairway. Like in, in ball golf, the fairway is the fairway grass and it makes a huge difference whether you're in tiny, tiny little grass or like, you know, three quarter inch grass or one inch grass. And that's, that's the excitement, but like trees are really the name of the game. And like, I was watching coverage from the, from the final round and it's like Ganon Burr throwing over top of the trees. You should, that shouldn't be part of the game is throwing over top of trees. I feel like this is going to, um, we're kind of transitioning into a point where, um, disc golf at the pro level is going to be much different than disc golf for the general you know, as far as the playing side of it goes, I think we are trending towards, you know, we're obviously trending towards more open, you know, courses for um, the pros and, and granted, you know, it is kind of fun to watch these pros grow really far um, when they can. But, you know, the general idea of disc golf is it doesn't like, like Matt says, it involves trees. Yeah, I, I took a coworker, uh, to play disc golf for his first time a couple of years ago. And uh, his response after his first round was, you know, this is exactly like ball golf, but with trees in the middle of the fairway. And to me, that's just like, that's just such an, it's, that's what disc golf is to, to me. And so I think, you know, as the disc golf pro tour might be trending towards this more open play, I think the, uh, the general, you know, us just playing in tournaments or playing casually. I think that, you know, that's not going to trend towards open course. It might still happen on the pro tour, but um, I think that's kind of where that stops, but I don't know. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. It's becoming such a spectator sport at the higher levels. And I think that is just, I think that's inevitable that you're going to get these more open courses to allow for more spectators. So there's a different way to go about it. And, me, it goes back to something that I saw Simon Lazat say maybe two or three years ago. Our equipment is different than a regular golfer's equipment. We have the ability to throw complex angles like flexes and things that they don't. And so I think that the highest level of our sport is 
using that equipment to push the boundaries of what's possible in these flight shapes. I am guilty of designing ridiculous fairways myself. They don't have to be like that, but I do think they need to be this golf type angles. The hyzer golf that we're seeing now is played like they were hitting golf ball. If they could make the disc go straight up in the air and straight down in a straight line in front of them, they would. The only reason it's even coming off at any angle is because they need to get it to sit up for some glide to get some distance. It's not the same game when you're playing it that way. And I think there's ways to go around this. This is maybe the only time people have heard me or will hear me stick up for courses like this. There is decent enough park style disc golf courses to have space for lots of spectators. You, the Jones Park course for DDO, which is again, not my favorite, but that is unapologetically a disc golf course when you walk over to Country Club and say that is a golf course. If you can have those style courses, you have space for the people. You've got space for the bleachers. There's walking paths that are already integrated with the parks. There might not be pro tour level ones all over the place, but I would much prefer to see people approach existing parks and say, hey, can we pull the pins here and make this course a little tougher for a pro tour event than just phone up the closest golf course that they think they can afford the rent at to the venue that has the disc golf course on it. <sighs> yeah, venues are always going to be tricky. I think like something on what Kale's got going at the preserve, which is, I think, an abandoned golf course, right? Like, I don't think that's, they don't, nobody plays golf there anymore, right? No, I think they own it. Actually. Yeah. So that, and then plant trees. And then yeah. in 20 years, greatest disc golf course in the world. It's got all the amenities, the infrastructure for spectator events, and it's got a golf course for disc golf specifically, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, there's, especially on the West coast, I think this is where like the West coast has some advantages. They've got golf courses with huge trees, which you, you need tall trees if you're going to put a disc golf course in there because otherwise people are just going to be thrown over top of them. Right. So places like that, like I think people are going to have to, if they want to keep doing ball golf courses, on the pro tour, they've, they've got to start finding courses that have enough trees. I don't think, I think they need to stop thinking about like markets and places where there's already disc golf courses. I think they really need to start looking for like, let's find a golf course that is underused and has a lot of trees that we can carve a full 18 holes into and then start there. Let's not find a course because it's convenient and then see if we can jam a disc golf course onto it. Cause I, I don't think it's helping the game. I don't, it's, it's just not exciting. And then if, if it doesn't have enough trees, then you're painting artificial OB on the ground, which doesn't film well and it doesn't play well. Yeah. I, I like, yeah, I should retract. I don't think that there can't be a good disc golf course set on top of a golf course. I think Glendevere is actually a really good example of doing it the right way. But every time I think about it, I go to places like Mulligans in my head. People that don't remember that, that's the Utah Worlds where James won. Um, and Utah State's has been. That course sucks. It yeah. sucks. And then don't having, having to go back to back from that to the fort, which was amazing. It was right? like, oh, the golf course again. Hey, the fort. Oh, the golf course again. Yeah, I get the problems with the fort. It looks dirty because it's all needly and dusty and things was, like that. But I want to play there so bad after one. Even before the holy shot, yeah. I wanted to play there so bad. Yeah. But it's disc golf. And I, that's where I'm curious when when you see this is like, uh, you know, Paul Beth and Dylan Cease, they bought that property and they're using, they're building Cactus Rock. I think we're going to start seeing a lot of places like that where, you know, especially as there's more money coming into the sport and you see these you know, top level players like Paul Macbeth, you know, I'm sure Simon Lazat is eventually going to do the same thing. Um, and, you know, they're going to buy these properties and they're going to design these courses to be disc golf courses that are spectator friendly and kind of have that sort of melding of both worlds. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, right now it, the, 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 state of the sport is that we have to use these ball golf courses and unfortunately they're not designed for disc golf so it's kind of like you're making do with what you got and and 
you know, just to be able to allow spectators. The other point I wanted to bring up was, you know, I, I'd be really curious because, you know, I know it can be hard to film in the woods. Man and I both have experienced this, but you know, it is really fun to watch. You know, we just brought up, um, the Nordic center. That was one of the, you know, it was, it was a challenge to capture everything, but it was still fun. And I feel like that is a good wooded course, um, with fair, fair fairways. Um, and it, uh, you know, it allowed for some great spectator, you know, viability for as far as the, uh, watching it goes. Now, do you think people can line the fairways there? Probably not. Um, most holes anyways, but then I guess, you know, the whole point is that, you know, do you, do you, the guys think that the disc golf pro tour is leaning towards more in-person spectators and that's where they're trying to focus their attention and get, you know, get the revenue from, or is it purely disc golf network as of right now? I think it's gotta be both, right? I think the majority of their revenue is coming from the, the television product, but they're trying to grow the spectator experience more than anything. Cause I think they see that as the key to expanding the financial pot. And I'm not sure that it is. I don't have a good line on that either. The, the, the golf world has it like who, well, you guys might not be as degenerate as my other friends, but who doesn't want to go to waste management and have, see the best golf, have fun on site, be right there in it. And there's got to be an angle where, like, eventually Disc Golf Pro Tour is going to make more money selling beer on site than, you know, doing their live broadcast. Yeah. But at the moment, it has to be that it's easier to do. There's more infrastructure in place. We did run into some bad coverage of deeply wooded horses because they couldn't get good enough signal to have the broadcast working. Like, it's a real challenge. But I think their answer to the challenge isn't, Right, the right one. It's not phone the nearest golf course, like we said. It's scout better locations that do have good disc golf and do have good services. Yeah, because if like it, if you have a great course, you're more likely to get more people coming out because the event's going to be awesome. What about how's this? I just thought of this. You know that triple mando structure that they have at their events, usually on the first hole, big metal like lattice structure. Why not use the one of those on every hole? Yeah, put it 400 feet down the fairway. Yeah, or at least 50, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've got trees but people could throw over top of the trees, I'm serious. Like, why not Why not every hole has a triple mando so you're keeping the shots in the airspace that you want the disc to be going instead of over top of all the obstacles? Is that an option? Yeah, I guess if you just set it far enough off the tee that it's not something that would make someone miss their shot but change the shot selection they'd have to have. Which is tough. Just put the two-meter rule back in and make <laughs> sure there's enough trees to scare people from throwing hyzers over everything. Yeah. Man, I never thought you'd get me sold on the two-meter rule again, but... <laughs> I never thought I'd ever consider it, yeah. I'm Honestly, I'm for the two-meter rule for courses like that where you don't have to throw tree level... Like you don't have to throw into the canopy or over top of the canopy. I'm I'm kind of okay with the two meter rule for those courses because I think the point is, like you have to plan the root of your disc so that it's not flying into tree branches, right? Yeah, it's just a change in what is the bunker. The bunker yeah. is now the big green grabby thing, not the sand trap on the ground or whatever. Yeah, but man, like they got to find some good golf courses soon because I lose interest at those courses. Yeah. I can't think of one. Like this Lake Waco one is one of the better ones. Glendivere is probably the best in my head, and the rest of them are all fighting for a piece of the bottom. Yeah, and I'm curious to see, I mean, if we use the Open at Austin as an example, this year they've completely redesigned it from last year. It's like, you know, there's not many holes that are the same. It's a completely different course. Um, and I'd be curious if that's something simply, you know, they take the feedback from Lake Waco and, you know, maybe do a redesign next year, find out which holes worked, find out which ones didn't, and go from there. Um, I'm curious to see how well the Open at Austin is received this year because they've obviously done a number of changes and um, it'll be interesting. So uh, we would be watching it right now if uh, if we weren't recording, so. It is one of those tournaments that seems like it's kind of on the edge. 
So it was Austin, then they swapped it out to be Belton, and then it's back to Austin two years now. Seems like they know they need another spot in Texas. Yeah, and I don't think they have trouble finding the um, finding the spectators in Austin. I think that was kind of like one of the big boons of being there is that they got a lot of spectators last year. And I think that is kind of, I don't know, I'd be really curious if maybe that's one of the reasons that they're kind of uh, expanding this whole ball golf course thing. Um, you know, you pick your destination first based on the population of disc golfers and people that want to play or pl- people that want to watch. And then, you know, it doesn't really matter where you play from there because you got the spectators. And uh, But I'd be curious to see, you know, I mean, it's kind of a whole nother conversation. I'd be curious to see how their viewership on Disc Golf Network drops off. Um, if, you know, you have these courses that aren't as entertaining to watch, and then combined with the fact that they, you know, the big, the big uh, talk is that they upped the prices, even though it's kind of not really upped, but um, you know, might be a whole nother conversation. <laughs> have the pricing model we could talk about forever. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'd be really curious to see, uh, see how that goes. Speaking of the pricing model, the pricing model really only changed because I'm guessing USDGC and European Open either want to charge more money for the media rights or Disc Golf Network doesn't want to subsidize those costs this year. So those two are basically back to a pay-per-view system, which sort of highlights one of the issues with the Pro Tour is that they sort of control most of the events, but USDGC is an Innova event. European Open is a Dismania event. And they have a different attitude towards media rights for their events. I've heard the Disc Golf Pro Tour has a very specific attitude about their media in general. Uh, I think, and I could be wrong, that when you sign up for the DGPT, you, as a player, with a tour card, there's something about you essentially surrendering your rights to your own media. Pictures taken of you belong to the DGPT, and then you can buy them back for your own social media from the DGPT if you want. Yeah, like for during the events, you mean? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Which is a step further than I expected. I'm sure that's the case for major sports leagues and stuff. You surrender your rights to your team. Your team surrenders your rights to the league. The league sells your rights to whatever broadcasting company. Yeah, and I, I'll say even for, you know, for for us with Park Pro, they most tournaments in their sort of wafer form, they do have to surrender the rights. But you know, it's one of those things like for us as a media company and and you know, generally media, they need need to have a waiver saying that I'm allowed to film you, um, and so. If you are participating in one of these tournaments, if you don't read the fine print, you're that's essentially what a lot of them are saying. Um, and you know, that reminds me, we should remind our TDs to put that in there because it is a legal requirement. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me, but I'm more curious if they're going to ever look at avoiding those events like USDGC and European Open that are owned by disc manufacturers like the intellectual property of us dgc is owned by innova whereas most of their tours are have been just run as tournaments not not owned by a a disc manufacturer and is that a val is that a viable long-term solution for the disc golf pro tour like these are pdga events not dgpt events Fortunately, they're two of the three biggest events of the year. So, which is why they're on, on DGN, right? Yeah, that's why they're there. It's an important part of the product, and you know that they handed that waiver to Innova for their media rights, and Innova said, "No, oh, we want to have you pay for those rights, or we're going to retain them for our own marketing." Yeah. And they went, "Oh shoot, never mind. We can't miss out the, on the event, and you have all the bargaining power." Yeah. Rats. I wonder if we'll ever see a time when, like, the USDGC is not as big a thing anymore. Because if if DGN is like, well, we're just not going to film it then. And then who is, like, USDGC is going to be on the spin TV again. Like, they're going to get Gatekeeper to come in. They're going to get Park Pro to come in and film it. 
you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> but well, we're not going to be able to pay for the rights, but yeah, unfortunately, yeah. it's like where the players <laughs> go and everything too, right? That's the other thing yeah. is they're willing to put extra money into the event because they know it's good marketing for themselves. And so if any of us dropping quarter million dollars on USDGC more than the other guys are, players are going to show up. The best play will be there. And that's a door I don't think that DGN wants to open to another company who could do it for a similar quality and similar price. I'd be concerned, though. I, and I don't, I, I guess I don't, uh, it's a bit of naivety on my end of not knowing who owns the events. Like, you know, say what happens if Kale at the preserve decides that he also wants to um, get Disc Golf Network to, to pay for the media rights. Um, well, that, that's exactly it. Like, you know, it's is it a slippery slope? Like, how many of these events are going to start uh, asking for money instead of, you know, having the Disc Golf Network come cover their event? Well, it's a different thing, right? The USDGC is so ingrained with the culture of the sport. Everybody knows it, and everybody wants to see it. The Open at Austin is not that, and they no. don't have that kind of bargaining power. The bigger ones, like, yeah, if a secondary media company wanted to really give them a run, and try and shake things up. I'm sure you could walk over to someone like uh, MVP Open, Maple Hill, and say this is also super ingrained in the sport, and we want to take you, European Open, USDGC, and these three other guys, and we'll pay you, and we're going to take them on. And they they very well could. It's the the littler tournaments. OTB Open, nobody cares. We're all going to watch it, but you don't have history following, yeah. to be able to bargain like that you might be able to start a competing pro tour just with usdgc as your cornerstone yeah if you have a usdgc and then a bunch of tournaments across the country and you produce it well all of a sudden that's a com- that's a competitor to the disc golf pro tour with one cornerstone event i think if you had two or three cornerstone I... events like slam dunk yeah, the, I mean, I guess the one uh, on that note is, I guess my argument against that would be that the it uh, doesn't the Disc Golf Pro Tour have a deal with the PDGA to be the official tour of the PGA? Sure. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we're the unofficial tour of whatever. Yeah, but then the uh, USDGC becomes a non-PDGA event. No. Is the Rusty Ratings Tour not PDGA event? <laughs> yeah, they could still get yeah, it sanctioned. It's... I don't think the PDGA would stop sanctioning it. Yeah, I'm not saying that we're trying to get the gold star from the PDGA in this thought experiment. I'm just saying I want to have a different media company deal with these events and we'll don't even have to label it as a tour. Yeah. Why not why not have somebody else sanction it aside from PDGA? Oh goodness. If you've got the USDGC <laughs> and you and you decide you want to start your own sanctioning body. I mean, if you ever watch professional boxing, yeah. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. They don't have to exist. And those things happen because people have arguments that split their sports, but they still keep on trucking. Yeah. There's the state athletic commissions, which are government organized. And then there's like 12 different uh, federations that give out belts. There's the WBA, the WBC, the IBF, the IBEW, the... The um, DUI, the I'm just naming acronyms now, but <laughs> there like there's a world champion for the WBC. There's a world champion for the IBC. It's not it's not impossible that somebody like Innova doesn't come to terms with DGN one year and all of a sudden there's a competing tour. Yeah, I just want to see how fast it would grow to tour level over just like we just don't like you guys anymore. We can stream this on YouTube or whatever. And that's what you guys had to do because your own platform wasn't good enough. We'll be okay. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, it's a lot of interesting thoughts there. I mean, who's to say that, you know, someone, USDGC doesn't approach someone like TS, well, ESPN um, or Fox or something like that and yeah. they get the rights, right? Totally independent of it. And it's a small community. You're, like, we're kidding ourselves if we don't think that everyone at Innova knows the name of everybody that has operated a camera for DGN or in any other coverage company in the last 10 years. Yeah. Hi, we've hired you on 
you're our consultant for the production because ESPN doesn't know how to flip the cameras to the important spots, and they know how to do all the broadcast stuff better than anybody we've ever had. Cool. Yeah. It's on on Friday at 7 p.m. on ESPN3. And then all of a sudden you have a viable competition for the Disc Golf Network. Yeah, more than viable. Yeah. It, again, the problem we've always, always had with these sort of things with ESPN is that they never have enough staying power. We get one tournament shown two months after it happened, yeah. three hours in the worst time slot, whatever. I don't think that's a viable competition because on demand all the time is always going to be better. But there, there is a path there with the mainstream broadcaster to get it in. I think we've started asking more questions than we're answering now. I know. Yeah, it's kind of how's uh episode's gone so anyway uh, if you guys have any opinions on this uh drop a drop a comment let us know what you think um if you started a competing tour would work. you put it on ball golf courses or would you have it focused on video only smaller crowds <laughs> but the best disc golf courses in the entire world yeah if you could choose between amazing wooded disc golf courses or big open courses with the spectators what would you do let us know in the comments. Um, and yeah, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Head over to our Instagram. Uh, we're going to have that giveaway going on r- r- as soon as we're done this episode. So um, check that out. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook. You know, all the good spots. All the good spots. It does seem like we're winding down. And I have a question I want to put to you guys because it's been I've been thinking about it since we started talking about Waco's Hole 18. I really want to come up with what our collective dream 18 would be sometime. I don't know if we should keep it Canadian or we should go international with it. I think there's a, probably a debate to be had on every hole in our 18. Well, hundred percent. And hole 18 at Waco is a pretty good contender for a, a dream 18, 18. Sure is. Maybe for people that throw further than me, but yeah, are we talking are we talking Dream 18 to play or Dream 18 to watch? I think we have to go to watch and assume that <laughs> or if we're saying play, assume that we are at the level of play yes, right, that right. it takes. Uh, any 18 holes if I'm throwing 500 feet is a Dream 18 holes. <laughs> <laughs> if I can hit a 30 foot wide fairway, I'll play all the holes you got. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not hitting first available, let's let's go to the ball golf courses all day yeah yeah no i think that's a really good idea i'm gonna have to do some thinking yeah i have to do some membering spot not not this episode but maybe for a future episode maybe it's just one one hole a day or one hole per episode and we do it over 18 episodes i said do you want to come back next week with a whole one pitch let's do it let's do it and uh in the comments of this episode let us know what your favorite hole one Yes, give us some ideas so that we can discuss it. So, yeah, awesome. Well, thanks for listening. Join the Patreon. Thanks to Disc Golf Park for uh, sponsoring this episode and all our episodes. So, hell yeah. yeah. And from all of us here at Parked Pro, get well soon, Noah. We'll be thinking about you.